It's only a couple of months until The Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes is released, and Nintendo has released a bunch of new details in the form of an overview trailer. But you know us. We're positive that there are secrets to find and the old analysis machine is on the case. However, be sure to watch our gameplay videos of Triforce Heroes from E3 and PAX since both show many details that we'll be referring to here. We'd also like to thank Ryan Gartman of What They Call Games for his translations throughout this analysis. The trailer provides the first real idea of just what the story will be. Throughout it, the king of an unnamed land tells of his plight and what the Lynx can do to save them. The story is relayed in a papercraft style that's never been used in a Zelda game before. Here we see the princess who is renowned for her style and beauty, but an evil witch tricks her with a cursed present which forces the princess to eternally wear a plain leotard. This is obviously an embarrassing situation for the girl as we later see her trying to cover herself up. The king then puts out the call for a hero, which is where Link comes in. And it is the Link that we're all familiar with too since he has his traditional blonde hair. However, we're not entirely sure what happens at this point. We do know that the king believes in a prophecy where three heroes come together in the form of a totem, emphasized by this totem statue in the middle of a fountain in town, though we're not sure how Link becomes three different people. Another aspect we're not positive of is the Triforce panel that the three Links step on to enter the next area. According to the translation, this is an entrance to the Makio, or Haunt of Wicked Men. Essentially, it's a foreboding place full of demons, monsters, and evil people. Ryan isn't sure what the final translation will be, but he suspects something like a den of evil. So the question becomes whether the Links are entering another world when traveling through the stages, or if the panel is simply taking them to various parts of the kingdom. But just what is it that's splitting Link into three separate people? While we don't know the answer to that question, we do know that this is the room where the multiplayer is accessed. First, you must speak to the old man in order to access the multiplayer options. These include local play, online play, and download play. The last option is simply quit. Once the multiplayer is activated, the other players appear on the colored portals in their designated color to work together. Story-wise though, is this splitting the normal Link up and each has his own will, or is each player from another world that's the same as this one and coming together to solve the same problem? Or maybe we're just thinking too hard about this. At any rate, as we thought, online play's communication is confirmed to be limited to just the icons on the lower screen. It's still unknown whether all of these options will be enough for players to work together, especially first-timers, but Nintendo does seem to be promising a solid connection throughout the experience. In a neat little easter egg, the background of this scene is actually in the shape of Japan, likely meant to emphasize the online play with anyone in the country. As we mentioned though, download play is an option. However, we doubt that the full game will be playable like this. It makes more sense that it would be limited to the competitive fighting mode, the arena. Here, three players face each other in combat while dodging obstacles. In this case, meteors. We also notice that this arena is in the sky, just like the Sky Temple we pointed out in our previous analysis. So we wonder if there will be multiple arenas themed to the different regions in the game. In the end, the scores are tallied and the players are ranked with 20 rupees going to first place, 10 to second, and 5 to last. But we are curious whether players can bet rupees in this mode in order to get a bigger payout. There's no evidence of course, but 20 rupees seems incredibly small when we saw Link with around 7,000 earlier in the trailer. The multiplayer room also holds a giant map showing off eight distinct areas. In the center is the castle and right above it is the ice region. Going clockwise from that we can see the temple, the fortress, the forest palace, the desert, the volcano, and the floating island. We've already seen many of these areas thanks to the E3 and PAX demos, but the desert is new. More importantly though is the fact that the trailer confirmed that there would be 32 levels in total. That means four stages per region, which is more than the 24 levels featured in Four Swords Adventures, though it's difficult to say which will be the longer game since the actual size of the stages could differ greatly. At the same time we see eight different level themes. On the top left is a bridge which we believe is part of the castle region. Next to it we can see the Lynx crossing a portion of water thanks to the new Water Rod. We believe that this is part of the Fortress region mainly because there's a scene later on that matches up with this one. It even shows that it's the third stage of this region and is called the Moblin Fort. It could be part of another region, but it does make sense to have a bunch of forts surrounding a fortress. We should also take this time to point out that fairies will once again act as the life counter like they did in Four Swords Adventures. 
Moving right, the next video panel shows what we think is the temple region. Here we can see the Lynx stacked near a vine-covered wall while fighting Poe's. One is green while the other is blue, and this looks to be a gameplay element as the green Link defeats the green Poe, but the stack runs away from the blue Poe. So it looks like players will have to reorganize the stack so Blue Link is on top in order to defeat it. The reason we believe that this is part of the Temple region is because of a boss fight against a larger Poe later on. This takes place in a library area, which would make sense to have in a temple. It's hard to pin down the nature of the boss fight itself, but we believe its necklace is its weak point. During this short scene, it's glowing and seems to be dragging the Poe around, so maybe hitting it disrupts the Poe's attacks. The next panel is another scene from the Volcano region, though it's not in a dungeon. While we don't see much, this appears to be the volcano itself and matches up stylistically with a scene from earlier in the trailer. It confirms that not all of the stages will take place in dungeons, which is something we see a lot of in the trailer. However, they are all guided experiences, it seems, much like the levels in Four Swords Adventures. Below the volcano panel is gameplay of the Floating Island region. We know this thanks to the gap near the walkway with open sky beneath. The actual gameplay shows the Lynx fighting what appears to be either a fiery pea hat or a completely new enemy. There is one more scene of the floating island though. It shows the Lynx having to use cuckoos in order to fly across gaps and reach the platforms. But is this just a one-off maneuver or something that will have to be done quite often? Continuing on, the next panel is from the ice region. Here we see that ice physics will indeed be in place as the totem of Lynx get around the hexagon panels. However, it looks like certain panels crack once the Lynx walk off of them. But not all of the hexagons crack, so it seems the players will have to be sure not to step on those hexagons again. We do wonder though if these certain hexagons only crack when the players are using the totem formation. Otherwise, the players are fighting a blue whiz robe. But it doesn't look like Blue Link is required to defeat it, so it must simply be an ice whiz robe. Another scene from the ice region demonstrates how puzzles won't always be quite so simple. This one features the Lynx having to follow on the other side of a giant snowball. They have to cross certain gaps while the snowball is blocking heavy winds. Mistime any of these sequences and the players will lose hearts. It shows that players will have to quickly and precisely work together as well. However, this region is also interesting because it features two different bosses. One was featured in our gameplay from PAX and as we can see from the bottom screen, this was the fourth stage. The other boss is more snake-like and we see some examples of how to fight it. The blue Link uses fire mitts to melt the icicle on its back and release extra hearts, while the green Link smashes its rock-like face with the hammer, similar to how the Helmosar King was fought in the Link to the Past. What we're most curious about though is whether this means that each stage will contain a boss or mini-boss at the end. We've seen from the demos that not all the bosses are huge monsters. One features the players tracking down an especially tricky Cyclops. But even if every level doesn't end with a boss, there has to be at least two. So it would make sense to have one at the end of stage two and the other on stage four. So at the very least, there could be 16 different bosses in the game. Next up is the desert panel where we see the Lynx tossing each other up a set of large cliffs. However, it doesn't show how Red Link will be able to make his way up. Is there some kind of trigger that needs to be activated or could an item retrieve him somehow? This same mechanic is used later in the trailer as we see the Lynx tossing each other up to the top of a small pyramid with the key. Placing the key on top unlocks the way forward. It's simple but emphasizes the teamwork aspect of stacking. The final panel is from the forest region, which we believe will be the first area. This is mainly because we get a full screen version of this scene where we see the Lynx learning the mechanics of making a totem in order to hit the Deku scrub. Later on we see more examples of totem tutorials as the Lynx must throw each other in order to reach the switch to a large wooden gate. Finally, during the portion that explains the communication features, we see that the level with the wooden platform is also part of the forest, specifically the third stage. The only areas we can't place both feature enemies riding on top of Armos. The first is a Moblin, while the other scene shows soldiers riding them. More intriguing though is that all three links are on different ones as well. It's like some kind of bumper car event, but we have to wonder how they got on top of the Armos. It could be connected to the nearby panel. Maybe standing on top of it creates an Armos beneath the player? While that may be all of the new areas we can see from the trailer, it also gave us a good look at the items and costumes featured in Triforce Heroes. First up is an item we're calling the Fire Mitts for now. It acts like the Fire Flower from Super Mario Bros. in that it throws a fireball to melt obstacles. 
It also has the same sound effect from Mario 2 as we discovered from our hands-on time at PAX. I guess it isn't the first time Mario and Zelda have crossed over. Another new item is the Water Rod, which works pretty much like the Sand Rod from A Link Between Worlds in that it creates a pillar of water that the Links can cross. However, it's not clear if it can do anything when not near water. Meanwhile, two other items have new functions as well. The hammer appears to be able to change the angle of certain platforms in order to reach new areas, while the hookshot can be used both to cross gaps, but also yank handles in order to spin a wheel and activate the water spouts. It's not much, but it's nice to see their uses expanding. Then there are the costumes which have been a big part of Triforce Heroes ever since the game was revealed. But thanks to this trailer, we've now learned how players will obtain new ones. At the end of a stage, we can see three large chests. Inside each one is an item. In this case, Green and Red Link obtain a Tektite shield, while Blue Link gets something completely different. These items can then be taken back to town, where Link's hair is blonde again, signifying that this is not a multiplayer portion, and give these to Madam Taylor. Madam Taylor is quite the character and a bit of a cat lady. We see two in the shop, though one looks like it gets squeezed a little too hard when she's excited. At least we're pretty sure that's why the poor thing is shaking. Otherwise, Madam Taylor's shop has three options. Order, Catalog, and Do Nothing. We suspect that the special items are given to her which expand the catalog. From there, the costume is ordered and can be changed into at the beginning of each stage. We then see several new costumes, the first of which is a ninja-like outfit called the Black Robe and Gale Blade. Next is an outfit called the Matching Look, but we have no idea why. It looks more like a Japanese Sentai costume with Zelda markings. The Hylian Crest is on Link's chest, while the Triforce of Courage is his belt buckle. Even the Hylian Bird's wings are on the side of his helmet and his sword's hilt. It's a shame he doesn't do a special pose. Then there's the Water User Robe, which likely strengthens the Water Rod in some way, though we have no idea how. After that is the Spin Attack Armor, which we've seen from previous demos. But there's demonstrations for the final three costumes. The first is the Zora suit, which will allow for super fast swimming, while the Goron suit makes Link impervious to lava damage, walking through it like it was nothing. It also bears a resemblance to Darunia, though Link still has the green loincloth from his Goron Link transformation in Majora's Mask. Finally, there's the spiky suit, which we believe prevents Link from getting caught by the various kinds of like likes. The costumes seem like a great method of adding replayability to Triforce heroes. As we saw before, it's not possible for every Link to get the same material in a stage, so replaying the stage to get the material you missed is worthwhile in order to see every possible costume. But it's thanks to these costumes that replaying the stage hopefully won't feel exactly the same as the first time. The process should avoid getting too repetitious though, as we see a shop near Madame Taylor's with different materials for sale, including the Tektite shield. Finally, we got a small look at what single player will be like in Triforce Heroes. In this mode, the other Links are referred to as imitations. Link is able to switch between them all on the fly to help with puzzles and enemies. We assume that they won't take damage when you're not in control. But it also makes the gameplay a lot slower. It makes us wonder if the stage will be modified in any way to better fit the single player and multiplayer modes. But that's all we could find in the overview trailer for Triforce Heroes. It's looking like a unique take on multiplayer Zelda compared to previous entries, but we do wonder if playing alone will be nearly as much fun. Hopefully the online will mitigate that problem, but we'll have to wait until October 23rd to know for sure. Of course, let us know if we missed anything in the comments. If you liked this video, be sure to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at GameXplain to keep up with everything we do. Thanks for watching and make sure to stay tuned to GameXplain for more on Zelda and other things gaming.